So each of you will have six minutes. All right. All right. So if you would join us, please, I appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much to Prosumers International. I'm very happy to be here, and of course, this issue ties right into uh, much of what we've done at the county. Uh, as you know, I've been a county commissioner for 16 years, and uh, before that, a state rep for uh, four years in the Texas House. Uh, I, I have, uh, I've, I've always heard that one out of four people have a mental health condition of some sort, and so that really gives you. Uh, uh, a, a sober thought about uh, who all is out there. What I, um, what what happens at the at, at and I have to say the county because they do uh, your major mental health your uh, institution here besides the jail, which is the major mental health care provider in Bear County. Unfortunately, is the Center for Health Care Services, and they are uh, uh, basically a, a county run uh, entity. They are funded in part by the, the County of Bear and the University Health System, which is your Bear County Hospital District. Uh, they are, uh, they've got an impossible task almost because uh, the state of Texas has so incredibly underfunded mental health care. Um, now, notwithstanding that, Leon Evans, who is the head of the Center for Healthcare Services, is a national class leader who has consistently delivered uh, great leadership uh, in a state that has historically underfunded mental health care. I think at best we're probably somewhere in the middle of the pack. We used to be 50th or 51st in per capita mental health care funding in Texas, depending on whose, whose stats you believed or what, what survey was done. I think we're probably closer to 35 or somewhere thereabouts today which is not very proud when you a uh, proud statement when you consider how large we are but the center for healthcare services under the leadership of leon evans has uh, developed a curriculum for for school police in the united states um, they have a restoration center where they will serve 26,000 in this year 26,000 uh, consumers prosumers hopefully and uh, and thanks for saying prosumers, because that really tells us about the need to get ahead of the power curve in dealing with these, uh, these patients and these uh, needy individuals who, who need that help. Uh, the current system reacts without uh, a whole lot of discretion oftentimes. Uh, we have to work on de-escalation techniques. Uh, the CIT training that the city, uh, the city and the county participate in, but is essentially driven by the Center for Healthcare Services, teaches law enforcement officers how to not overreact when you're called to the scene of a person who's having a mental health episode and uh, how to de-escalate the situation, uh, kind of talk them down into a mode where they can uh, get the treatment that they really, really need. And uh, I was really proud to be there at almost every one during my 16 years on the court uh, of, of their uh, training sessions where they trained uh, 75 to 100 police officers or sheriff's officers in how they should deal with these folks instead of tasing them, instead of shooting them, instead of putting them in a headlock and throwing them on the ground and getting all crazy. How does a police officer who has historically been taught to uh, use their muscle, use their brain, and, and help this person to uh, functionality instead of more dysfunction? Um, we, uh, we, we want to encourage people to concentrate on their well-being and not their, their challenges or their illness. Uh, we have a crisis center, as most of you all know, and um, there's a respite capacity there for three to four days. Uh, at this, uh, the Drexel Street is, is a facility that's near uh, Page Middle School, uh, and that's, that's helpful. But in Texas, Bear County is 49th statewide, I understand, in per capita funding. Uh, we're, uh, and the funds are not equi equitably distributed across this state. So that's something we all have to work on. The legislature's meeting, you have an opportunity to contact your representative, your senator, the governor, the lieutenant governor, and try to get them to realize it's not good enough for Texas to be so far in the back of the bus with re respect to funding. 
So I want to again thank Postsumers International for uh, hosting and highlighting uh, the need for mental health care uh, approaches, uh, both funding as well as treatment, and for a greater understanding amongst our citizenry as to the struggles that people are in and how we might best deal with those struggles so that people can return to a good, healthy, functional life and not be further harmed by the affliction that they've experienced in their lives. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. you so much. Hi, my name is Cynthia Brim, and I am running for mayor. The reason that I'm running for mayor is primarily to fight the corruption, to fight the wasteful spending of our tax dollars, and thirdly, the oppression that's going on here in the city. I notice this gentleman has a sign back there. That's absolutely correct. You know, what's going to happen to the residents on the west side? That is a serious issue we need to deal with. Who am I? I am you. I am you, 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 and you. I am a citizen that is concerned about the things that are going on in this city. We need fair and equitable representation. Someone that is willing to stand up and do that which is right. Instead of being dictated to, we need someone that's going to represent what our needs are within the community. I want to be that voice piece for you. My background includes marketing and advertising. I led a successful career for 30 years. I'm also a military family member. My husband is currently deployed in Afghanistan. Why? Because the Obama put a hiring freeze on all the government jobs, so he's over there putting food on our table. I have also an extensive background in politics. I've worked for several years in the background, helping other people to get elected into office. When I came here in 2007, I said, you know, I'm going to do this. My ancestral roots run deep in Texas history. Just to give you a little tidbit of information, my grandfather in 1731 was a colonist from Spain, and he was actually the first mayor of San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So my roots run deep. I decided I was going to do something because of all of the congestion. That was my primary focus here in San Antonio. But as I went out on the campaign trail, I found out, as I said, the corruption surfaced. To give you an example of that, the people at La Vida, you know, they were told to get out of their location, and these people had been there for, you know, since the 1940s. And then they, they asked the city council, and they asked the business development services, why do we have to leave? Well, we want to do something different. And so this summer, as of July 2015, these people have to leave. What the media put out, or the city put out actually to the media, was that they wanted to do something different, which was connect Hemisphere Park to La Vieta. So if in fact that is true, why did they have to leave? A good sign of corruption. Thirdly, the oppression. People on the west side are being harassed on a weekly basis to sell their property. Now imagine if that were you. You don't want to be harassed. Now. <clears throat> I have a, a good example to share with you, and that is a family that was on the east side. It was a senior citizen and a senior, senior citizen couple, and the city kept charging them with uh, fines and violations, and after a while the little old man died and then left the entire state to the wife, and then she finally passed away. The city came in, took over the property, and knocked down the, the building that they had and claimed it. So this is what's going on. Now, as far as, I know this is a, a forum for health care. What I would like to do is address that. <clears throat> I suffer from panic attacks. Why? I'm a type A personality. <laughs> I am motivated to help others to reach out. And oftentimes I put a lot on my plate. So I know what it's like to have panic attacks. I know what it's like to see people that are suffering from depression. I have a sister that suffers from depression. and. I have researched, not that I know a whole lot about it, what's going on here in the city, but I have researched how some of the citizens here that are homeless on the street that are being treated, I've seen it on television, you've seen it on uh, Facebook, a, a recent incident where a homeless man in, in LA was tased, 
and he put his hands up in defense to protect himself. And when he had enough of the tasing, he turned around and they shot him five times in the back. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. What is good to know is that the police officers here in San Antonio have received, now to what portion I don't know, they have received some sensitivity training, and that's important. We need to know that and how to deal with these people that have these mental health issues. So I think we're on the right track. Furthermore, uh, Mr. Evans, he set up the prototype model that everyone around this country is following. And I think that's important too because we're setting the standard. And so we have it here. It is funded by the state, it is funded by the county. And what's nice about it, it works on a sliding scale. You know, I don't have to tell you about it. You know how the program works. What I am concerned about is how many people are they servicing on a weekly basis? How many people are they serving on a monthly basis? Is this enough? Do we need to expand that? And if so, how are we going to do it? How are we going to fund it? There is a need that is out there that has to be met. We have to address it. Not everyone is going to have the ability to fight back. So who is going to be their spokesperson? I want to be that spokesperson. I am a crusader. You give me a challenge. I will meet it. I may not know how, but I'll tell you this. I'm a God-fearing woman, and I know God will show me how to do this. I have zero political experience as far as in the arena, in and of itself, but I want you to give me that chance on May 9th. And I ask for your support because you have the control. It's in your power. On May 9th, I pray that you select Cynthia Brim for mayor. If you would please join us at the podium. Hi, um, my name is Cynthia Cavazos and I'm a candidate for mayor. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk to y'all a, a little bit that's really, it'll probably open y'all's eyes on um, mental health. Uh, a five-year plan to a biennial. I'm going to speak about the, bu the budget process. Comptroller of Public Accounts is an agency that works for the legislature. Our budget is formed and given to the Comptroller for assessments. The decision of les les sorry, the decision of legislature is legal and binding, which means they have the last say in the budget. Our Texas governor will be given a copy of that budget for a two-year term, a biennium. His copy is the one he uses to amend any dollars for savings and accounting purposes. Our city manager is the comptroller of the city. She in turn, <coughs> excuse me, she in turn give mayor and council her proposed budget. As your next Texas mayor, I will appropriate dollars from that budget appeal any overages and se sequestrate to a separate account for use and non-use to pay for all debts and save into those accounts. Our city will have daycare for all that need. The owner of the daycare facility need to obtain a certificate through Health and Human Services and Child Protective Services. Each daycare facility will be at mandate to install cameras, which means this will aid in the safety of our children and the caregivers that are caring for our kids. Our city budget at this time is not balanced, but $1 billion will be for our city infrastructure. The added or missing $488 million will be for city employee raises and for new employment to our city. Ivy Taylor, she is expecting a 100 new city employee to me, that sounds good. I like that. I might have to add a little bit more based on the homeless project that I will have instituted. This project will house all homeless into their own home on a lot of 7100.00 square feet. Um, it 7100.00 square feet. I think it's 7100. Yeah. Um, they have, um, in, in the Bearcat, they have 
square feet for the, the whole area of the property or location. Um, it should house singles on this one lot, at least four to five studio homes in that area. All on that lot will split a yearly payment, which is a $600 a year payment for land tax. I will mandate our city constituents to pay $600 a year on commercial and residential property under um, 7,100 square feet for each person that, homes, that owns a home or that is a business owner. I will order a new tax in all I will order a tax to all non-homeowners. They will pay a 50 cent or a $1 tax for education per paycheck. Tax dollars for our city will not fail. This is the Mental Health Assembled Forum. This information I mentioned will help clients in our city to heal. Uh, my name is Cynthia Tika Vossos and I'm a mayor for, a uh, candidate for mayor. <laughs> You're welcome. Douglas Henry has arrived. Um, either of them, Michael, Michael isn't here. Sorry, I didn't, I don't know y'all all by face, so I'm, okay, please go. Y'all got this better than I do, so I'll just let y'all manage it. Okay. Is this the microphone? That is, that is the microphone for the videotape. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. It's a wireless mic. All you gotta do is just talk. Okay, okay. Well, um, thank you all for having us here today. And um, how, are you, how are you doing? And thank you for lunch. <laughs> Louder? Okay. Um, my heart is in this community. I have volunteered here in Texas for over 40 years. My first volunteer um, position was with children with special needs with the Circle T, Riding Circle T Riding Therapeutic Center, where they used horses to help these children, and I became a board member um, because I was involved with them. I also have volunteered with children with um, MS, and also whenever there's an opportunity to help children, I try to. I met this young boy recently who has no arms, and um, it was very difficult for him and he, would, he told me this, he's about 15 years old because he's not able to use the restroom in public without his mother's assistance or without his brother's assistance because he can't undo his pants. But I believe that the most important issue here in San Antonio this year and has been for years is the discrimination against children and persons with special needs. I feel that of course we need to go ahead and have transparency in our city. We need to not raise tax dollars but we also need to make sure that this is a thriving community and I don't believe that we can have that unless we help our persons and children with special needs. I mean that is such an important issue for San Antonio to be a healthy thriving community. I have an experience um, at the courthouse. I was there. I worked from the bottom to the top. I was a um, worked starting as a clerk and w with two of us, we put together, which is now the juvenile justice court systems, which helps children throughout the county um, with the different issues they have because they have to deal with their own parents that have special needs, people with drug addictions, alcohol addictions. And so we need to start without funding, I believe, within the community to help these different children and to have an awareness um, throughout the city for um, persons with special needs. I think that's such, so important. Of course, you know, it takes a while to get funding, so when we can get funding, that would be good, but I think that as a community, we need to work together for an awareness for these persons. During my time at the courthouse, I also was um, one of three people who put together domestic violence courts here in San Antonio and their programs. Again, that is helping persons with special needs, especially so many children that have the scars from being in those homes of domestic violence. Um, that is such an important issue. I mean, you have uh, people being killed because of that, people committing suicide because of the domestic violence. So again, I feel like I helped um, persons with special needs because of that, listening to these stories and hearing these people going in and out of jail, their recidivism, or their, their um, continue to um, 
I guess, commit crimes because of their domestic violence issues. I know I suggested to some of the sheriff's office people that we need to try to educate these people while they're in jail, while they're sober, um, so that they can actually begin to get the idea of what it is that they need to do to stop this um, revolving door of domestic violence within their families and causing those scars um, for children with special needs and themselves. Um, you hear so many stories of people that need help. I'm sure most of y'all have met somebody that knows somebody that has had an issue with domestic violence and sometimes it's just that one man or one woman in the home that they um, are, uh, what do you call it, they're abusive, verbally abusive. That's also a form of domestic violence. A lot of people don't realize it, but you know, people that are abusive with that, you know, the wife, you know, that she can't do anywhere, she can't go out the door, she can't shop on her own. You know, that man doesn't know that he's abusive, even though he is, but he's being, I guess, controlling. But yet at the same time, he's being abusive, and the same thing can happen with the wife. And um, you see the children have to deal with all of that. So we have a, we have a, a child that maybe needs to have some type of therapy and I truly believe in art therapy, like at the Incarnate Word, the Ecumenical Center, where they have art therapy for children. I was in an accident one time and had to, um, took me a long time to recover. I was in a wheelchair for a year, but I realized that art therapy is such a wonderful thing. And what I'm trying to help in the community do with this mental illness awareness is that we need to go ahead and try to promote things like that, like art therapy or community gardening where people can go into the community and garden because gardening is such a wonderful therapeutic thing for um, mental issues. It just kind of gets you outside, gets you around people that you don't know, and it kind of helps to build your, um, I guess, build a pathway for you to get back into, you know, your normal living. And at the Center for Healthcare Services at the Haven for Hope, I think that we need to go ahead and try to see how we can expand that and work on organizations that we already have rather than trying to secure new funding or until it gets here so that we can go ahead and be on a moving path to help people with special needs before um, we get funding. Thank you so much. My name is Pogo Machello Allen Reese. I'm a Desert Storm veteran. And as you know, Dad, our soldiers have been in war for about 12 years now. But when you have a situation where you're throwing veterans over there in Haven of Hope and mixing them in with everybody else, that just exacerbates our problems. The first thing I would do as mayor is those two buildings right across the street from the Greyhound Station, those will be turned into shelters for veterans only. They will be dedicated for veterans, psychiatrists, and doctors and split that stuff off. Because I don't know if you knew this, that veterans have probably some of the highest suicide rates in the whole entire country. And the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting it to get different results. You have people have been in political office for almost 16 years and if you can't get it done in 16, you're not gonna get it done in four more. And one of these candidates is a pharmacist. And if you look in the newspapers, it's saying that veterans, if you go right down Broadway Street, that's a big old billboard, it says the number one killer of, the, of veterans, soldiers, is prescription drugs. When you go over to the VA, they like to talk to you about five minutes, hand you some pills out the door. And if you look in the Dallas Morning News about five to ten years ago, this happened to one of us veterans. They put us in a psych ward for about two weeks. Okay, here's some pills out the door. You go next door to the hospital with some Bacardi and Coke and kill yourself. So that's not going to change with a pharmacist as your mayor. So the only thing I can tell you, the first thing, as I said before, is splitting us off from the other ones. And as for, I'll just give you a situation myself. I rode a bicycle all the way from Houston, all the way to Victoria, Quero, Gonzalez, all the way up to Austin, back down to San Antonio, because I protest abortion. When I got here protesting abortion clinic right over here on St. Pedro, 
uh, Officer Tiller and Officer Kelly thought I had lost it. Okay. Yelling and screaming out there because if you ride 300 miles on a bicycle, you ready? Okay, I'm ready to talk to anybody. Then police came, you know, and basically we talked it out. And there's another situation right over in Travis Park. Uh, but it was too. So many times I protest. <laughs> but that time, Officer Tiller, Officer Kelly, handcuffs go over to the UTSS, UTSA. But the only thing is, I had been trained as an abortion protester what I could and could not do. But a lot of people talk about homelessness, have never been homeless. I have been homeless all across the state of Texas. My folks were Native Americans. We fought for all of this property, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. And the only thing I can tell you, if these politicians are not talking about growing this economy, talking about building skyscrapers so that uh, we're not sprawling this city out. Because when you ride around on beer and you're seeing some of these people walking around talking to themselves that may not be on the street, they are homeless. I know what it's like to be homeless on the streets of San Antonio. I have slept in the tunnels out here under the freeway. Oh, let me put my glasses on. I can't see. Oh, okay, we're three minutes. Okay, but I have been sleeping out here in the tunnel. So I know about some of these guys over in Haven Hope. And I don't think it's fair for us to be thrown in with all of them over there and hope it's going to be all worked out. And as she's saying, all these generations of being here, I have been, lived here for a while. I get to a point that when you get over there in that Haven Hope thing and you can't take it anymore, okay, let me go somewhere else. Let me get away from all this craziness. And But there's a whole lot of people talking about building a big old huge football stadium, but anything that has, has to do with generating money for them, the rich people, they offer that. Okay, let's build a football stadium, but we can't build a veteran shelter for the veterans in military city. Nobody's talking about that one. But I'm going to talk about it because I visited Boston, a New England Center for Homeless Veterans, a six-story shelter, veterans only, in military city. And it's not fair to talk about a football stadium, a basketball arena, when veterans one in four are homeless on the street. Uh, my name is Rhett Rosenquist Smith. I'm a candidate for mayor of San Antonio, and uh, I wanted to uh, mention my middle name, my mother's maiden name, Rosenquist. Uh, someone said you should honor both sides of your family, and I, I certainly agree, so I always want to uh, do that. And I was raised uh, in a uh, single-parent home. Uh, my father was a Navy, United States Navy veteran, but he uh, left the home when I was about uh, between six and eight years old and I didn't see him again for many, many years. So I was raised by my mother and my grandmother and I certainly believe that, that I uh, benefited from, from that in that I, I learned a, uh, a way of life uh, in a small town where you know your next door neighbor is an extended family mm -hmm. And so now that we're talking about prosumers and these issues, uh, I want to talk about uh, health of the mind. I know that sometimes we talk about mental health, but uh, I know that uh, other people talk about mind science. And I, I thought that all the candidates here today uh, showed some sensitivity about this issue. But really, the health of our mind is something that is an ongoing work for every, every person. All seven billion people on this planet and all 1.9 million people in San Antonio and Bear County. So uh, I thought that uh, Mr. Ponce uh, had some really good suggestions, just new creative ways to uh, you know, help expand the mind, help people relate to one another. Uh, I certainly am sensitive to veterans issues. I'm a United States Navy veteran myself and uh, I, uh, applaud uh, Mr. Reese for suggesting that we do not adequately fund uh, veterans issues. So that will give you a, clee, a clue as to what uh, exactly we're facing here in, in, in San Antonio and in South Texas because uh, I think, uh, you know, 
Tommy Atkinson mentioned the fact that Texas is way, way, way behind the curve. So we've got many, many issues here. And in South Texas, uh, it seems like we're always battling against North Texas to, you know, be legitimate or, you know, have, uh, you know, have our issues heard or even understood. And uh, tragically, uh, talking about mind science, I would like to talk about history a little bit and the fact that, uh, you know, uh, they don't understand the history of South Texas. And we in South Texas have been here. I, I came here and moved here in 92. So I've been on a continually learning curve, learning more about the history of South Texas. So I want to talk about, you know, uh, treating our veterans. I formed an organization called Veterans for Education Reform. It was really to talk about lobby our State Board of Education about about uh, history and social issues uh, that the State Board didn't really seem to, people from North Texas just don't get South Texas. But uh, I also want to talk about the issues of not being part of the problem. You've heard the expression, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So I would just like to point out the, the sign over here on the side. It says, who will throw the West Side residents out of their homes? It's right, right over there on the orange and black there, so you can see it really well. <laughs> and uh, we don't want the city of San Antonio to be working at cross purposes to what we're really needing to accomplish here in prosumers and, you know, building a better health. And, you know, in some ways I would say that health of the mind is as important or maybe more important than the physical health of the body. You know, you can talk about heart disease and cancer and other things and those are certainly important and we're focused on those but uh, when we have a very violent community and I, uh, I work with the Peace Initiative and Patricia, Patricia Castillo and domestic violence and I've gone to the San Antonio Police Department for 20 hours of training so that now I'm trained with the, the uh, FACT, the Family Assistance Crisis uh, Team Training so that I can be a counselor in uh, the police substations and I am very concerned. I, I'm on the board. I mean, not on the board, but I'm a, a member of the uh, committees of the uh, national, the NAACP, and uh, I've worked with LULAC. I've worked uh, with uh, San Antonio's for peace building. So I think dealing with violence in, in whatever form, and, and it's out there, uh, you know, we've talked about domestic violence and other kinds of violence, but it's so crucial that the leaders be able to step up, and we don't want to manage this city as a business and unfortunately I think that you know uh, I don't want to name names here but the past administrations and the way we have a strong city manager form of government that's more interested in our bottom line more interested in that bond rating and so they're worried about you know oh can we show assets show what we've built instead of worrying about what about the you know, the mental health infrastructure of our communities and uh, so I, uh, I certainly think that, that I'll be focused on that and I'll be a hands-on mayor that's, that's wanting to work, go out into the community and really engage every member of our community in these issues. And I'm so thankful that you're here today and thank you for your time. And I'll, uh, I'll be working with you every chance I get. Thank you again. And you were here when we first introduced, but we, everybody has six minutes to tell their um, views, and then I'm going to be giving some questions that y'all can answer. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excuse my tardiness. Uh, I try to have lunch with my children uh, on Fridays, and it's my chance to have sort of one-on-one -on -one time with them. And they let me know when I don't make it. <laughs> and so um, I'm, I'm running late from, from Bonham Academy. Uh, and their cafeteria, but I'm glad to be here. This is an important issue. It's an, it's an issue that cuts across our city. Different populations of our city experience it in different ways, but we're all in it together because we live in the same neighborhoods. We, uh, our, cross, our paths cross uh, when we go shopping at HEB or at the mall, downtown, Wherever we go, we're, we're experiencing the challenges of lack of coverage for adequate mental health services 
and a lack of community awareness about mental health challenges in our society. I know that one out of five U.S. adults are living with a mental health condition. For children, that number is one out of ten. In terms of a serious mental health challenge, it's one out of twenty. And so this is a pervasive concern and it ex expresses itself in, in different ways. We see it in the homeless population that does not want to be penned in at a haven for hope. Uh, we, we see it even in our senior citizen population, which is growing tremendously. And they need a special type of care and uh, oversight and, and uh, a watchful eye, different than other age groups. Uh, we know that we can make a difference when we intervene early. And so we, we need a more effective effort to screen and identify young children so that, we, so that their parents and their loved ones can cope with them and learn how to uh, take on this challenge, live with it, and manage it throughout their life together as a family unit. Here are my overarching kind of policy goals on uh, improving mental health services in San Antonio. Number one, we need to focus on better community awareness and education and intervention programs. <clears throat> because unlike other health challenges, there's a stigma with mental health challenges. Unlike a child who breaks their arm, and we know the protocol of what it takes to stabilize, secure, and mend and, and help them cope if it's a severe break that they're going to have to live with the rest of their life. We, we actually know how to do that pretty well. But we don't know how to do the same with a child that has a, a mental health problem, a depression, a condition that is going to be with them for their whole life. And so that early uh, intervention, that community awareness, so that all of our family members know that it's okay and that there's, there are services that they can avail themselves to and community support groups that they can be a part of to help nurture their loved ones. I want us to recognize that we have a large veterans popu veteran population in our city and we're not doing them justice. As we have a one-stop center for people who want to build homes or buildings, I believe we should have a one-stop center for veterans because there are a lot of different services for veterans, but it's a very fragmented system. And if anybody needs you know, help in, in going to one place to try to find access to federal, state, county, city, community college, uh, higher education services, it's these men and women who have sacrificed themselves for us. We should do that for them. Drug rehab. This is a serious problem in our city, and we see it in other social um, health indicators. In, it's, cor it's correlated to child abuse, to domestic violence, to crime. Drug rehab is in, short, is in shortage. We do not have enough beds for those who make the courageous decision to try to shake the habit they don't have a place to turn to who will immediately try to take advantage of that moment. And that's unfortunate because we end up paying for it in the end in all these other ways. I mentioned senior citizens. I have friends who are strong advocates of our senior citizen population. I'm looking at one of them, Betty Eckert. Uh, I, I understand fully and on a personal level, how our population is changing because it is aging. My mom is a, a nurse for senior citizens. The city, because the state is failing to properly provide oversight in group homes and nursing homes, the city needs to step up its role in collaborating with senior citizen advocates, with the 
the healthcare facilities, big and small, licensed and unlicensed, to try to raise the standard of care. Uh, finally, I want you to know we can do this. We can do this. This is in our reach. I have no doubt about it. We have the people, we have the resources to make this a priority and advance the health care, the mental health care agenda for our city. Thank you. Thank you so much. being here. Thank you. So we've asked everybody to speak for about six minutes and Janet's kind of keeping the time for us. Great. And, uh, then we will have questions uh, and people are passing me questions and I'll be asking them. So thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, and hello to my fellow uh, candidates. Thank you very much for being here at the wonderful Cafe Commerce and I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you for a few minutes and uh, look forward to enjoying the questions that you will have for all of us. Uh, uh, first of all, my apologies for arriving a little bit late. I was at a funeral and uh, with this rain, that, by the way, if you haven't gone outside, it's starting to really come down very hard. Please be safe on your way home. Uh, so I apologize for being uh, late. I, I normally would not ever be late to a, uh, such an important forum. My name is Leticia Vandepute. And for 24 years, I have had the blessings and the opportunity to represent this community in uh, the Texas legislature. First for nine years as a um, member of the House of Representatives and the last really 14 as your state senator. So I bring that 24 years of experience in bringing people together, in solving some of the very, very big challenges that we have, proven results and effective leadership. But I think what's important for this community and particularly for all of our prosumers is that for you to know my, a little bit of my background. I see folks in here uh, who have known me for an awful long time and other new folks uh, and friends that I haven't had the opportunity to visit with. But what you need to know is that I'm a pharmacist and have been for 35 years. And I'm a mom of six and a grandmother of six, soon to be eight. In um, August, our son and his wife are expecting twins. But what you need to know is the importance of my background. My first job as a pharmacist was at the San Antonio State Hospital. I was the pharmacist on the clinical wards of Arnold and Bowie. And so think about what was happening with regard to mental health and services both at SASH and in the community. We were doing the trials, the medical trials, for a new pharmaceutical that showed great promise called Loxetane. Can you believe that? Because before that, what was utilized really was so severe with the side effects, the extrapyramidal symptoms, the tardive dyskinesia, so our loved ones who suffered from a mental condition really had so much of the side effects with the current medications. It was a time when uh, San Antonio State Hospital still had electroshock therapy. And so I was part of my training uh, was there. I loved it. And there were the people who were there who showed me not just how to be a good pharmacist, but how to be a healthcare professional. I will be forever indebted to the nurses, the social workers, the psychologists on staff that taught me about treating all of the healthcare team in a unit. After that experience, I was the outpatient uh, pharmacist at the now what is the Center for Healthcare Services. So I was on the clinical team, and for three years, that the area of mental health was my sole focus. I was on the board uh, as an advisory committee when I owned my own pharmacy for now what is the Center for Healthcare Services. And 
for so many years have been the lead sponsor of bills that reformed uh, our mental health system and how we approached. I want to say thank you for those folks who have helped me and who have always come to the Capitol with that vision and with that advocacy. So let me tell you about mayor real quick. I'm running for mayor because I think I can bring that type of experience of making sure that we look around the corner and see what's coming. You need a city hall that's effective, that's efficient, and that treats people with respect, no matter what their backgrounds, no matter what their uh, physical conditions, their mental conditions, and, and their, where they live. We know that you need a city hall that's transparent, <coughs> but you need a mayor that's going to be able to bring people together to work with council members for the really big things. And the really big things for us are that infrastructure of roads and drainage. We'll have that opportunity in the 2017 bond package. I really believe that we ought to have 75% of that dedicated to the streets and drainage. Second thing is public safety. San Antonians value that those first responders. And then we really need to work on that workforce issue. We're going to continue to grow the economy, but we can't with our current workforce. We need to make sure that our students, once they're in the pipeline, that they have that post high school something, whether it's that certification program, the licensure, an associate's degree. So I want to make sure that our city does the things that the city is supposed to do well. We have a perfect opportunity right now with our city manager looking at a search for a new police chief. How we treat people in this community with mental illness and how our police does, even though we've, we've improved greatly, we need to continue. We need that working relationship with the county and with the state so that we can improve the number of dollars that come to our community for our mental health needs. I want to be your mayor because I'll use every single relationship, every single friendship, every single knowledge base I can to improve the quality of life of the people who live in this community. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. On behalf of my colleagues and I, I want to thank everybody for inviting us and, and allowing us to uh, speak our concerns and our plans for the city of San Antonio. I'm Raymond Zavala and I want to be your mayor. I bring 25 years of experience in leadership, in financing, where tough decisions and cuts had to be made. What is lacking right now in the uh, government of San Antonio is leadership. It's very weak or non-existent. They're hiding things behind us, behind our backs. I, 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 on Wednesday, I attended a meeting where the mayor, Ivy Taylor, is the head of the uh, of the committee and she has the right to select the other members of that committee that's absurd because you know what we deserve better i want to have a committee where if i'm elected the mayor i don't want to be the one who has to select the people because that leaves a lot of questions in mind the good old boy system the buddy system where you pick those, they're going to vote just like the ones in favor of what you want. No, I want somebody to stand up to me and say, hey, Mr. Mayor, that's not right. I don't agree with you. Okay, let's, let's talk it out. But we can't do that right now. The meeting I attended was part of that sign up there. It was disastrous. The city was ill-prepared. It was embarrassing. And why? because our illustrious mayor was out campaigning at the uh, North Side Independent School District instead of being there with the people. I don't like show boaters, I don't. I don't like anybody who goes around show boating. I did this and I did that. When you ask me a question, be prepared to handle the truth because I will tell you the truth. We talk about mental illness. We have two entities, the city and the county. Really? That's called redundancy. Why can't we combine both of those and combine the funds and get better treatment for those that are affected? Don't you think so? I mean, would you want to pay two car payments for the same car? I wouldn't. 
Common sense is what we're lacking at city council. And matters not who or what you are as long as you care and you get the, uh, the care that you need. Haven for Hope, I'm glad that they do have a, a part in, in this uh, great city of San Antonio. My wife and I have taken a fact-finding trip up to Rapid City, South Dakota. They have a homeless shelter there. They have the general population, they have the veterans, and they have the family sections. As I walked into the building, I wasn't greeted by an armed guard. I was not searched, but I was greeted by the director who asked me, how may I help you not fill out this form? I said, sir, I'd like to take a trip, a tour. Oh, sure. The floors were immaculate, glass-like. All the beds were made up in a 45 degree uh, manner as you do in the, in the hospitals and the military. People were working around the pantry, the dining room, the, uh, the laundry. I asked him how much money they received from the city. The guy blew me away when he said, we received no funding from the city. If you want to stay here, you contribute four hours to community service. Haven for Hope, they have a cleaning staff. Why? Somebody's getting something off of that. Once again, the buddy system. I acknowledge to all of you, I will leave no one behind. My platform is this, senior citizens, the youth, the disabled, and the veterans in that order. And they will not be left behind. Come into, uh, to mental illness, my uncle was 84 years old, was taking a walk from his house to the bakery. He got stopped by uh, SAPD. He became he had an anxiety attack. So what do they do? They knock him on the ground. Two of them. I can't tell you how angered I was because my uncle was not mentally ill. He was presumed that he was. They had him locked up for two days. My aunt went berserk not knowing where he was at. I don't think that's fair. And I'm glad that they have sensitivity training, but we need more than that. So I ask for your vote on May the 9th, vote for ballot number four, and that's me, Raymond Zavala, and I, I don't make promises, I make guarantees. So please, spread the word, because our news media has not given the rest of us the equal opportunity that we so much deserve, as not only as veterans, but as humans. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you all for uh, sharing with us. And the way we're going to do this, is, fortunately we have a little extra time, so I'm going to ask the question and then any of the candidates who wish to answer this particular question will have a minute to answer it, okay? And then if we need a little more time, maybe we can be a little more flexible than that. But I wanna make sure everybody has, who wants to speak has an opportunity to do so. Um, and we'll just go from my, uh, so from y'all's right to left. Um, so my first question is, what solutions do you have for the challenges faced by people who experience strong emotions and, and have mental health issues and their interaction with the legal system. Many people, many of us end up in jail. Many of us end up uh, being taken down by police and hurt in that manner. Many, uh, there's just that interaction between the legal system and mental health doesn't always work. What solutions would you have to address that particular issue? Um, and as the second part of that, how many, how, how would you address how many of us are in jail? So, would you like to address that? 
Well, that's going to be a major issue with veterans because you have a lot of veterans that are getting discharged out of military with things like that. And I think it's called a Judge Advocate General for Veterans or something like that. Uh, but we need to have actually on the staff of the DA someone who's actually trained and actually a li liaison with the Veterans Administration to actually identify veterans when they first are arrested. And that's going to eliminate a whole lot of problems on that end. And what was the other part of the question? A lot of us end up in jail. Oh, what that's solutions do you have for that? Okay. Having somebody on the district attorney staff that is trained to deal with those issues with veterans. And as soon as a veteran or somebody is arrested like that, they can actually, uh, I, what is it, uh, a purge adjudication? I think it's a term for it. There you go. There you go. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, we were going across. Oh, you were going across. Let me just say this briefly because I've got another thing to go to. I uh, served for 16 years on Commissioner's Court and I founded the first reentry council uh, to try to pull people out that were unnecessarily jamming our jail up. When I first got elected, they said, Build another jail, build another jail. And when I was in the legislature, they told us, we have got a problem we cannot build our way out of because we had a, a prison space shortage. And I realized at that point that we've got to get underneath the, the underlying causes of why people are in jail and try to treat those. And so uh, although we have a 75% recidivism rate in our jail, we do have a, uh, we have a veterans court. We have uh, other uh, mental health courts. We have a reentry court. We have a lot of things to try to soften the blow of the difficulty that people find themselves in. So uh, this is a pretty progressive, and I think really a national model of county. Thank you very much. I, uh, I think it's so important, uh, you know, for you to ask these questions, and, and I uh, respect uh, uh, Mr. Reese talking about veterans and, and Tommy's great experience. Uh, you know, I've uh, tried to be in part of that reentry program that Tommy Atkinson has talked about, and that's a, a program where uh, non governmental organizations, uh, private organizations, charitable organizations are out there trying to help people. So, you know, because what happens when you're in jail and then, uh, you know, are you really going to get rehabilitated in jail? I mean, uh, I think uh, Mr. Ponce had a good point. You know, are we really educating these people in jail or are we just letting them kind of languish there so they can, you know, associate with other people who are languishing and, and really not? That's a that's a bad plan. You know, we need uh, we need mentoring programs, uh, not only in our, you know, uh, middle schools, but in our jails so that uh, these people actually have a good role model. So uh, basically, we just need the money, folks. Show me the money uh, that will help with these reactive mental situations and uh, deal with the, the jail situation. That, that's the way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. If there's one thing that you find out about me as we go along this campaign trail is that I will be brutally honest with you. You may not like the truth, but it will be the truth and it will be what I think. I do think we can collaborate together. That's what I think that we need up, up front between the mental health uh, members and the city. I think we need to do that. We need to establish something. I do think that making it mandatory that all of our police enforcement officers get the training, because that turned out to be a very positive move forward. Uh, also, I think that it's important that we realize that these police officers are just that. They're here to protect and to serve. So how much further can you go beyond that? I mean, it turned, let's turn the situation around. How would you react being a police officer? So we have to be fair, straight across the board with each other. Ma'am, you're raising your hand? No, she's got a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so I only had one minute, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I mentioned that I was a court administrator 
and that we, I was one of two people who implemented the juvenile justice courts and one of three people who implemented the domestic violence courts. Well, I know we do have the mental health courts, but I believe that the um, drug court and the veterans court kind of spawned off of the ideas that we started like 30 years ago. I actually think that we should have an, a court that's available for people with uh, mental issues or, ment or just disabilities. We should have a specialized court system put in for persons like that. I believe that that can be done without funding. I believe all we need to do is go to uh, meet with the county commissioners or persons in the city and I believe something like that can be set up automatically without securing funding and then later on they could actually fund a court that would be specialized for persons of special needs um, so that maybe they could be seen in three days or they're at the jail the same day that they enter so that we're aware of their situation. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we as Texans, we as San Antonians and Americans should be ashamed that our number one mental health providers are our jails and prisons. And it's that pipeline. As um, a member of the legislature, I'm not an attorney. You know I'm a pharmacist. But I've been the author of most of the specialty courts bills, including working with Judge John Specia at the time in the 1990s to create the Alternatives to Incarceration program, which began that child abuse and neglect docket, uh, the drug court, and also I was the author of the veterans courts. Number one, we need to maximize that funding. We need that sensitivity, but we also have to have the ability for the city, the county, our school districts to work together. Full implementation of Bear Cares, and what that is is to make sure that when our parents and our students who are identified with having some trouble in the school systems, that rather than start this criminal justice pathway that we realize that it is really a, uh, a health condition and make sure that we work together. Uh, you got to maximize the funding and as mayor I know that I would work with city council, our county leaders, our state leaders, number one, to maximize the mental health funding that comes to our community and to work more efficiently for the benefit of the families, not for the convenience of the system. Thank you. So your question was about how we can change the relationship between our police and uh, our citizens that are residents that are living with mental health challenges. And how to address how many end up either hurt or in, in jail. Or in jail in the process. Services or other mm -hmm. appropriate Well, um, there are three things that I think we should act on. Uh, number one, we should improve the training of our police officers to be able to detect and properly handle uh, residents who are suffering from a mental health uh, condition. We need them to be able to discern whether somebody is um, intentionally acting out in a criminal manner or they're, they're just coping with a condition that they have. Uh, that also needs to be built into their evaluation process and we need to track that as a city and have a report come to sit the mayor and the council so that we know if we are exacerbating the problem or not. Uh, I think we should do uh, more with the alternatives to incarceration. Um, part of that means having uh, health care services that are available and, and, and accessible to, to folks who are seeking and needed care. Uh, the biggest thing that we can do in Texas is to advance um, Medicaid expansion, uh, which will include services. Uh, for those in need of mental health uh, services. And, and finally, uh, we are rolling out how we intervene early with truants. This is an opportunity to identify children at the youngest ages who are suffering from mental health conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mental health and the police department. Okay, those are two different entities. Um, one, I think it's it's established on its own through the city um, communities, or I'm really not too sure how that works. 
Um, right now we have Haven for Hope. I don't know if a lot of y'all know um, about Haven for Hope, but it's the largest um, homeless shelter in the state of Texas. Um, they have a lot of homeless people there and people with disabilities that the city um, Center for Healthcare Services is taking care of. Um, you have PCY Courtyard, and that is supposed to be for people with mental issues or um, a, a stop before their transition to the Haven for Hope member side. Um, the police department and securities need to really be a little bit more uh, lenient. Um, and the only reason is is because of the services that both sides deal with. I know there are certain areas that they have to try and pinpoint to figure out to see if they're still or if they are or if they've committed a crime or whatever but in that area they're safe. They have tons of surveillance cameras. <laughs> Well, my idea is this, only because I've experienced uh, with my uncle, and um, I believe that all law enforcement personnel should be trained into identifying someone with a mental illness issue at that moment. That is totally different from an act of crime. If it is a mental issue at the moment, then they would take that individual to uh, the station where he would be evaluated by a certified doctor and then put into a program. What does it cost? Nothing, because the doctors already exist there. How much time would it take? Almost nothing, because it's going to be processed anyway and that their family would be notified immediately and let them know where he's at or where she is at. And for me, accountability is number one on that list. Stress is the worst thing that can happen to a person because it leads to anxiety and it leads to mental issues. And we need to stop that at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. So another issue that affects many of the citizens of San Antonio and especially those of us who deal with mental health issues um, is housing and a lack of affordable housing and homelessness and how that is addressed. And um, I would ask you to address how you see maybe a comprehensive program or those things working together. Yes, we have Haven for Hope. In, in the uh, Prospects Courtyard, it was built for 500 people. The first night they had 700. Um, one of the, yes, it's a great program and people are still being raped in the courtyard, people are still being robbed in the courtyard, and people are still being assaulted in the courtyard. So we still have an issue that needs to be addressed. So my question is, are the questions, like, this is a, a group of questions around affordable housing and dealing with in the absence of that, the homelessness challenges that we still face. So, oh, one, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I get my? Go ahead. Keep going. Okay. Oh, he's wait. I did, you got to speak on the. We were gonna go. We all, we all we're all going. We're all going on in order. Okay. If you want. Am I next? Then? No, actually. Uh, he is. You yes, start up there first. Next. We started. We're starting over here and going this way. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Is it one minute again, Anna? And yeah, let, actually, this this. You want to go with a different one? We have time. Let's do two minutes each. Yeah, because that's kind of a long. Question. Yeah, this is the long question. So two minutes each, um, and then if we need more time, uh, please you let me know that we'll we'll address that. Okay, and we'll still just go in order. If if it's something that you choose not to speak to, that's fine. I don't want everybody to feel compelled to do so, but I want everybody to have a chance. It's called V Hat. Is modeled after what they have up in New England, the New England Center for a Homeless Veteran. 
but I came up with the acronym Veterans Emancipated from Homelessness Assisted by Texans. Those two large buildings right across the street from the Greyhound. And this problem about women being raped, you separate the men away from the women in their own shelters after you get the veterans out of that situation. That shelter where it's uh, constructed right now is in one of the worst locations in San Antonio with trains blaring all night, rocking you up and back and forth like this. You are constantly on alert. It was never supposed to be inhabited by humans. And especially ones with mental illnesses. It was built on a piece of land that the city could not sell to anybody. So anybody wants to rave about Haven Hope, go and stay there tonight. <laughs> okay. I don't want this to count against my time, but can you succinctly restate that question so that we're all on the same page? So dealing, one, with affordable housing. How do we have housing available okay. for people who are on fixed income, Good. receiving SSI, um, and given the shortage of that many people do end up homeless and how do we deal with the homeless issue we still face in our city good okay uh i think that those are certainly related uh back again to the issue of money that uh you know if you have housing out there but nobody can afford it or uh and for some people are just not going to be able to function and they end up on the streets so you know we need to have a better way to deal with that and Probably here in uh, in South Texas, uh, we have our own unique uh, uh, because we are an international city, a frontier city in some ways. And I, I just uh, you know I think of our seniors, I think of our children, I, I think of uh, the fact that you know we're just always trying to play catch up. And I, I think uh, Leticia Vanderpute mentioned some legislation that she'd introduced. Uh, one was uh, using uh, medication on foster children, and one was using restraints and isolation on children. I think, I don't know if you sponsored both those bills, but they were certainly long overdue. And uh, so uh, the, the fact is, we need to go back and correct those problems. And we have a lot of senior issues in our city. I would like to. Uh, make our city a, a greatest generation city and really focus on senior issues but uh, you know I hope that we're going to get a commitment from all these candidates and then later from all our taxpayers that we're going to actually come up with the funding to do this. Thank you very much. Okay first I want to say that I am against handouts and I believe the people that are in the situation where they're having a financial crisis that we should help them okay I'm all for that but along with that I do believe that we need to do drug testing for people that are receiving these benefits because I have heard of families that are actually getting all of these benefits and then they're accepting and selling drugs on the side and they're bragging about it out in public to their friends so that's got to go now, with regard to the homeless, I have done extensive research on this. This is what they're doing across our nation, in all the big cities. They are providing homeless individuals with housing and also with a social worker that will help them reintegrate themselves back into society. Why? Because it's actually costing the cities and the county and the states less to give them a house with a social worker than what it is to leave them out on the street. Why? Because, number one, emergency room, doctors, the cost of a police officer, and uh, all that that's uh, accompanied with that winds up being much more costly than what it is to give them a home and keeping them healthy so, and then teaching them how to reintegrate back into society. And so you can go on the internet on my website, CynthiaBrimForMayor.com, and look up homeless, and I um, talk about it at length and what they've done, and I also provide links for you to, to, subst to substantiate exactly what I'm saying. Thank, Thank you. you.
And I'm going to ask you to repeat the question because I didn't totally understand. Okay, so um, many of the people who've been identified as having mental health issues live on fixed incomes. So affordable housing is an issue. When there's not sufficient, we live on the streets. And when we live on the streets, we end up at, a, at Prospect Courtyard. Mm -hmm. So what do you propose to do about having more affordable housing and in absence of that, um, improving services for people who are homeless or addressing the homelessness issue? Okay. Well, I actually, I actually think there is affordable housing now, but the situation with the person of if they're not stable enough to actually keep a home because you have like programs like with Wells Fargo who's willing to give fifteen thousand dollars down to like for a person to get into their home um, they just have to qualify and I don't know what the qualifications are but I think that we need to be able to as the remove the city ordinance for one thing that says something like um, only family members can live under that household and so I believe that we need to have maybe like a person pop possibly that would actually be like a sponsor or a sitter and live with that person and help them, I guess, change their life, empower their life and improve their life and get stabilized. And maybe um, so that that person can actually begin to have a home and know how to take care of it because I feel like a person that's not mentally stable would not be able to do that on their own. Um, and for the homeless situation i think that that i think that we need to try to i guess come together as a community and help people with mental issues stabilize their lives like i said with community programs like you know um gardening the community gardens or art therapy where they actually can begin to get mental mentally healthy but i believe that we also need to be very careful with our senior citizens because you know i feel that um, throughout the city where we have closed many of the city um, centers for seniors where they would go have lunch and you know visit um, a lot of that I believe helped seniors from getting um, depressed or having a mental situation because they were actually not going there for that food because I've eaten that food and to me I wouldn't serve anybody that food um, and so they actually would go there to for friendship and you know coffee with their neighbor that they wouldn't see so things like that need to be put back together somehow rather than having it in a location where they can't get to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very important issue. And it's an issue that's important for uh, San Antonians. It's made more difficult with families who know that they have a loved one uh, with a mental condition. Unless you've experienced it firsthand, when a loved one has no realization of who they are and there's no place to turn to in the family in crisis, it's a moment of terror. But then when the prosumer is able to regain their health, sometimes the burden of understanding then what they have put their family through and they've put themselves at risk and others, sometimes that feeling of guilt stands in the way of that full recovery. It is so difficult for families to make sure that they have a safe place for their loved ones. But this is a lot of San Antonio's. So how do we solve that? Well, first of all, the city of San Antonio has a policy that doesn't coincide with the state of Texas to maximize those housing credits to build more affordable housing. I'll give you the example. The state of Texas went through a great shift in that they've decided that the priority should be, and they're not going to give the tax credits to communities who continue to put only affordable housing in those areas of the community that are blighted. The state has said that we're going to put affordable housing in all parts of the community, that all neighborhoods need to share that type of mix. If not, you have the disparities. The city of San Antonio has the opposite policy, well-meaning, but they want to take care of those areas first that are blighted. So unless we want to maximize those funding dollars, the first thing I do as mayor is to make sure that our policies coincide so that we can draw down both the federal tax dollars that all of us have paid and our citizens have paid those IRS taxes and the state credits. 
We need to continually work on the affordable options, whether they're multifamily units, whether that's home ownership, but particularly for those who have family members with mental health issues. I can tell you having family members who are adults who are well and they get on their own and they get a job only to have their condition relapse. This is much like the understanding and other folks in the community think, well, they had, they had it together, what happened? Well, I'm sorry, mental illnesses are just like high blood pressure or diabetes. It's gonna continue and it's how you manage. And as a community, we have not managed our entire population and given the supports needed for those families. As mayor, I would make sure that our city departments, not just the police department, but all of our city employees understand and have that sensitivity of when you're working with someone who may have a, a mental health issue. A lot of times we want them to, first of all, make sure that they're safe, that they're not at risk to their own health and to others' health. And with that, that people need to be treated with respect. Thank you. Housing is an, an issue that is being expressed in different ways across the city. Uh, we know there's a task force that the prior mayor, Julian Castro, initiated, current mayor is, is leading today. Uh, it's bringing up a number of concerns on how to keep housing affordable in San Antonio, how to grow our neighborhoods so that they are of mixed income and and, and that folks who are longtime residents aren't being pushed out. Mental health is also a housing issue that should be at the table. We are moving forward as a city towards a housing policy. We need one sooner than later. When elected, I will make it a priority to complete this look at what are all of our housing needs and make sure that advocates representing the mental health community are at the table in shaping that plan. Uh, there is discussion about the 2017 bond issue. Uh, having some funds out of that capital initiative be set aside for housing, mental health concerns should also be addressed in that effort. Uh, Leticia talked about the lack of synchronization between the city's uh, affordable housing policies and the state's uh, policies, particularly on the federal tax credits. There's also a lack of synchronization and timing, not just that are the goals not aligned, but uh, the, the schedule of when certain reports are due at the city are not lining up on the state's timeline of when they need applications submitted and turned in. It's, it sounds simple. It's, it's frustrating. I've sat with a number of affordable housing developers in the nonprofit sector who are pulling out their hair knowing that they're missing deadlines at the state level because we do not have a city government who is actively partnering with them to help leverage those federal dollars. We need to change that. And as mayor, I'll pay attention and make this a priority. Thank you. Okay. Um, income, um, people that are middle class and they're low class, those are normally the ones that, um, or people that are going through lawsuits or the ones that end up homeless. Um, you have a person with a $24,000 income and then you have another person that's living in their own home um, paying, what, or making maybe $15,000 a year. So you have those two different types of people that are trying to make men's um, men's meet or everything need to, to run their family or their household. So once that middle class person or the poor person goes to a certain point where they can't pay for their bills anymore, they can't um, buy food for their children, they have to go into public assistance. So that once they receive the, those assistances, um, they have to make sure they follow rules and regulations. So when they start following them rules, or they break those rules, they in turn are sanctioned, or whatever. Um, so that means that they have to sell all their stuff, 
um, move into a homeless shelter and the first step would be um, for families it would be Haven for Hope the member side and then um, for singles it would be Prospect Courtyard. Um, building houses for the homeless isn't going to be hard. You know our budget we have a full one billion dollars that they're going to be able to use whoever the next mayor is going to be and them houses are going to be able to be constructed at 200 houses per month. That's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Affordable housing, it's a fantasy, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't believe me, look at the lofts on Broadway. Look at the building, uh, nice apartment buildings that they built at the intersection of South Frio and Guadalupe Street. They were supposed to be affordable housing. Some for the seniors. Really? I bet you I can count on both my hands how many of those apartments are for seniors. And why? It's all about the good old American dollar and the profit that these uh, investors can make. Another one uh, that's coming about is the Mission Road, soon to be a fantastic place to live. They displaced all these families there. And who voted for that? City Council to rezone it. They said that they uh, sent out uh, advisements as to how the people wanted that uh, place to be redeveloped. Really? That didn't happen. And that's okay. There will be some changes. We need to establish a program where everyone, regardless what, as to where, whether your, your status is 50000 a year or less, or even more, we need to integrate and establish where all types of uh, people can live next to each other and accept each other as good Christian folks should do. Unfortunately, our city council hasn't done that. As far as Haven for Hope and the homeless, I'd like for each and every one of you to ask for an itemized detailed uh, financial report from them. I bet you don't get it. How do I know? Because I've been asking for one since 2003 and I still haven't got the itemized one. So please, if we want to do something, let's do the right thing. Do it for me, because I do it for you. Thank you. Um, we have a variety of questions addressing financing and, and money. And so I'm going to uh, wrap those all together. And then if you could address just really how do we fund mental health services through the city? Is the, is the city responsible for funding mental health services for its citizens? And if, how and how does that, I know a lot of it comes from the state and the county, but what is the responsibility of the city to the citizens on that behalf? And um, there's also a lot of interest around the structure of the management of the city, whether we would still have a city manager, or if that is a uh, the way that we have a strong mayor and city manager and how that would affect mental health services are also some of the questions we're getting. So, um, it's, a, it, it's a little convoluted, but basically, does the city have a responsibility to help fund these services? And in managing all of it, is the structure that exists today still the one that you would uh, continue? And how much time do you want? And let's, let's go ahead and give uh, two minutes as well for... Two? That's a really long question. <laughs> I have a really long list of questions. Okay. How do we fund it? And how should we? I mean, is the city responsible for doing it? How much time do we have? Two minutes. Okay. My name again is Pogo Machella Allen Ritz. I am from Monroe, Louisiana. And there was a guy that I met down in Florida named Harry Shaw. He's invented an engine called a Cyclone Engine that will replace all uh, internal uh, combustion engines with, uh, he called it an external combustion engine. And we want to recruit this guy here to build those engines here. The first thing is creating jobs to just gonna create everything else. You don't do it from the bottom up, you do it, you know, you gotta bring in the jobs first. 
You got to bring in the industries. And the reason I chose to come and live in this city because the thing is, once we start building those engines here in this city, we start converting Lackland, we start converting the Via buses, we start converting all the city vehicles, and then the rest of the country has to follow us. You don't lag in, in technology like this. You have to lead. Everybody else is talking about program. I'm talking about prosperity, building engines here to re uh, revolutionize the whole planet. Uh, thank you. Obviously, it uh, gets right to the heart of our issue here. I think private uh, funding is out there. Uh, we can direct uh, our, our uh, city manager and uh, others to actually do a search for private funding. Uh, we've talked about the state of Texas, and uh, certainly we have a former le uh, representative and former senator here that uh, have been in those halls to deal with uh, that kind of funding. Uh, I, uh, I would like to believe that there are some sympathetic uh, ears in, in the legislature that are going to uh, deal with this. And I, I think that, that you all and all our candidates here are going to want to do that. But uh, we can certainly direct our, our city manager and others to uh, look for private funding sources, uh, try to find, uh, you know, a few dollars more uh, to provide for training, uh, to provide for uh, other services. And, uh, you know, I feel in a nation that is the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, in a state that has, uh, you know, the highest uh, outcome, out, out production of gas and oil uh, in the United States, that there's a lot of money. So, you know, maybe we're going to create a spark here with you and I talking to our friends and neighbors saying, you know, we've got money. We're the richest nation on the planet. And yet we are one of the most violent. This is one of the most violent states. When we talk about violence in the, our, you know, Bear County, it, it's atrocious. Child abuse, all the other issues. The money's there. And yet somehow or another, what's wrong? Do we all have mental issues here, you know, that we just cannot get over that hump of communicating with our friends and neighbors about this? Thank you very much. I failed to mention this, but I know that you know this because this is your field, but 30% of Americans are faced with mental health issues. That's a huge percentage. Furthermore, 20% of children also deal with mental health issues. My proposal has been from the very beginning to redo the budget. I think there's a lot of corruption and misuse of tax dollars that we can take those dollars that have been misused and reappropriate them to the areas that they need to be uh, focused on. Insofar as those that are homeless and have mental health issues or just even the average American citizen that has mental health issues and they're impacted by um, whatever circumstances that face them, and they're arrested by the police and incarcerated and what have you, I think that we can take, a, as I said earlier, a collaboration of all of you medical health professionals and we can work together to come up with a better solution so that we can appropriate these dollars to, to form a better system within our own city government. Everyone pays taxes, and since there's a huge percentage of Americans that face mental health, then we need to address this issue. 30% is huge, and I believe that between what you're doing here with the Center for Health Care Services, that's a good role model, but I think it can be improved upon. We just have to find out what that solution is, and I would favor taking monies out of the budget and appropriating it towards uh, mental health. Thank you. You know, I know mental health issues can happen from one minute to the next. I was on the committee to create the DWI task force here in Bear County about 30 years ago, and I know somebody who is drinking and all of a sudden they get angry and um, in the jealousy, you know, kill somebody or they're in a traumatic accident um, or somebody in their family dies. So I think that at any time anybody can begin to 
have a mental health issue, but I do believe that the city and the county and state should come together and get some funding for San Antonio for mental health issues. But I believe that actually, like I mentioned before, I believe this community can get started without funding if trying to put together an awareness program through the city and they should have money for that and at getting some getting these people involved in the community with like the gardens and art therapy. But um, so, and to me, the most important thing should be that we put something together when a person gets arrested that that same day that they have access to somebody who is interviewing them, whether it's the person who's interviewing them for an attorney or the person who's taking care of them as they like interview to go into the jail. Those people should be trained to be able to assess the possible situation of a person to have that if they have mental health issues so that within a couple of days or a day that they are actually seen by a court to be able to be assessed okay does this person really need to stay in jail or can we go ahead and release him on his own personal reconnaissance or to a family member um, to, so to me that would be the most important issue that we should take care of first is persons that get incarcerated just because of an ental, a mental issue that was created thank you Thank you. I believe the crux of the question was about the money and funding. And what role is appropriate for the city of San Antonio? Well, we know that the state, through the statutes, is absolutely the entity that is in charge of indigent care. That decision was made by the legislature in the 80s. Hence, the agents of the state are the county. The counties, by the hospital districts, by the property taxes we pay, are actually the ones responsible for indigent care. And in that indigent care, that's where you've seen the uh, Center for Healthcare Services, how that works, our, our mental health system, but it's the state. First of all, we know that we have made great strides. I'm thankful for those of you who fought with me and added on to my bill. Um, before it was part of the Affordable Care Act, to have mental health parity with our, our insurance uh, products here in the state of Texas. We couldn't have that for those, what we call ERISA plans, those plans where employers have their own retirement systems. But thank goodness that we have been able to at least have somewhat of that mental health parity. But the city can play a great role, and this is one area that no one has talked about in those who have dual diagnosis. Because that interface of those with addiction, whether by alcohol or drugs, usually will have that interface at the criminal justice side or it as a component of what happens on our streets, that homelessness. We need to make sure that we continue that sort of funding, which is, by, I'm so thankful that I was able to secure the $6 million that the state put into the detox center that is on, on the side campus for Haven for Hope. Because what has happened is, as you know, um, those loved ones and those San Antonians who are to have that, that diag the dual diagnosis, they first have to get a safe place to dry out and get clean. There's where we play a role because of the dual diagnosis. Uh, the mental health is basically that funding from the state, but we can play a critical role in those, and sometimes they get shut out of other programs because of their dual diagnosis on addiction and uh, diagnosed on the DSM with some of those critical illnesses. I think that there is an ability for the city to be a partner with the county, with the state, to maximize. And it's probably going to be that braided funding that we see in models that are effective across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the city does have a role to play in uh, funding services to care for residents who have mental health challenges, concerns. Um, will it be the leading role? No, uh, as Leticia described, the county really is the local entity who's responsible for managing local health care services. They oversee the hospital district. They authorize uh, whether their property tax rate increases or not. But the city still has a role to play. Uh, public safety is within 
the city's core set of services. Uh, in fact, if you go across the board, parks, libraries, now, everything that the city does has a role to play in providing and caring for somebody that likely has a mental health challenge. And so if we want to do more, you know, I, I think about libraries. You know, right now we have a challenge with the Central Library. Travis Park was reprogrammed and a lot of residents, a lot of homeless people who were hanging out around Travis Park are now occupying space in this central library. And it's changed the atmosphere of the central library. It, we need to help those who want to seek help, who want to find a bed to rehab in, who want to stabilize their lives and climb uh, to self-sufficiency. We need to help them because when we do, the other responsibilities in city government are more effectively delivered. So if we, if we actually can move the needle on reducing the homeless population, on reducing the population with drug problems, we advance the other clearly core missions and responsibilities of city government, from public safety to libraries to parks. Thank you. Um, mental health, um, the budget, and being able to obtain um, dollars from the city for like a set of healthcare services. And I'm really not too sure if the city of San Antonio is, well, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure they are um, funding Haven for Hope um, because I think they're a partner or something like that. Um, but right now, um, I'm going to say that I would not fund for um, anything else. Um, if they're giving dollars right now um, to these institutions, then I would probably stay in that area. Uh, but I know that they're already getting um, services from the state of Texas. So like uh, the city of San Antonio's health department, um, they receive their funding from the state. They shouldn't be receiving the funding from our city uh, revenue. So that's supposed to be totally out. They're supposed to get the monies directly from the state. And I'm going to try and keep that same process um, if I'm elected the next mayor um, for other agencies that are receiving monies from the state of Texas not to receive money from the city. And that's only because that's going to take away from the people. Um, we're trying to get jobs in order, job security. And if we're going to have that job security, we all have to collaborate together to make sure that we meet that goal. Well, as some of you already know, Haven for Hope receives $7.5 million a year in their budget. City gave up 2.5 million that's matched by the state and then by the federal government. What are they doing with that money? I, for one, believe in streamlining and holding people accountable. For example, I believe that the city council corporate welfare system should stop to date. This year they received two points under my plan. This year they received 2.5 million. The next year they received half of that, half of that, half of that, until they cut off and it becomes self-sufficient. Just like the one up there in Rapid City, South Dakota. We need to do that here. We have a moral obligation, not only as residents or citizens, but as human beings to treat or uh, seek treatment for those with mental issues. We fail not only as Christians, but we fail as people if we don't do something to stop this city council corporate welfare system. I, for one, believe that it can be done. You know, you can't just be handing out money forever to the same people. When is an animal and a cat's life, or an animal's life worth more than a human life? The answer is never. ACS received 2.5 million. Why? Where is the accountability of that money? 
We need to stop them, and we need to stop them now. This is a goal line defense, ladies and gentlemen, and we need to get the ball back on our court, the people's court. Thank you. Okay, um, so we're going to have one more question that everybody can answer for two minutes, and then each of you will have an opportunity for a quick wrap-up to say a few words. And if, unless there's any objections, I have been asked if Mike could give his first, because you have something else that you need to be seeing. So unless there's an objection from the panel, we'll let you do that first. Let me ask the question, the next question. I hope you have the answer to this one. I absolutely do. So um, many of us in this room know that recovery is possible. Woohoo! Yes. And when we say recovery, you know, we're talking about being able to live our lives and live our dreams and be gainfully employed and pay taxes. And getting there takes something. And one of the things we found that it takes is peer support, awareness, and training. And just, if I may indulge, um, at one point, ProSumers actually did a training for the Central Library on how to approach people who come in and treat them with respect and ensure that they get where they need to be. And if there's nowhere else but the public library, then let's look at why there's nowhere else but the public library. But there, uh, we actually were asked to do that, and it was very well received, and it altered the way people were approached, at least for a period of time, when they came in off the streets to the public library. So there are other things that can be done. And the question is, we know that recovery is possible, we know that we have a crisis in the area of um, services for people who are in crisis um, or who don't have any other place to go and may be dealing with some strong emotions. And the question is, are, as mayor, would you be willing, two things, one is to have our voice represented at every place where there is an advisory committee and especially those pertaining to the services we use. And two, would you be willing to fund a pilot crisis peer respite run by people who've been there and know recovery is possible? So, I'll let you answer it. Two minutes? Yeah, two minutes. Well, this gets at the issue I described earlier on, of course, the city has a role in mental health services because if you look at the array of services that we provide, we provide them to the general public. And within the general public, there is a certain percent of our residents who are living with mental health challenges. And, and so absolutely, yes, uh, I, I will support funding for a respite center. The answer to your last question. Mm -hmm. And I will also support the inclusion of advocates like prosumers to uh, be at the table in every advisory board or group that informs how we deliver the array of basic services the city provides from libraries to swimming facilities to our parks across the board. I won't be here for the closing. Okay. I just want to say, say yeah, I, I just want to say thank you for organizing this. Uh, this is a real exchange. Your questions really help shape the agenda and and the thinking of the candidates running. This is the right time to do this right? <laughs> before we get elected. <laughs> so it's very smart, and I'm I'm very happy to be here. Let me tell you, I'm running for mayor of San Antonio in pursuit of really a single heartfelt goal, and that is to make our city a city of opportunity for all of us, not some of us. And that means our fellow residents who are living with mental health challenges. Thank you. Thank you. There's two places most politicians won't go. They won't go out there and talk to some of those homeless people at that computers mm -hmm. or go over to the TWC and see all those people are unemployed. Because one of the first things that starts to break you down mentally is once you lose your job. No one up here 
but me has talked about creating jobs to create opportunities, to create all this other stuff we need. Everybody's talking about shuffle some money over here and shuffle some money over here and shuffle some money over here and they ain't gonna do nothing when they get into office. So if you don't have any ideas on how to recruit businesses to come here and bring jobs and opportunities, none of this other stuff they're talking about is ever gonna happen. Uh, thank you very much. Again, uh, you've done a fantastic job, as uh, my very well noted, uh, you know, to get uh, thoughtful questions before the public and uh, to get this community dialogue uh, started. Uh, and congratulations on all the things that you've already accomplished that you, that you mentioned. Uh, as far as the crisis, uh, the mental health on every single committee, every service the city is involved in, every office, I have no objection to that. Uh, I, I would support that. I don't know, uh, you know, if our strong city manager uh, is going to be amenable uh, to that. But, uh, you know, maybe we can find a city manager that's more amenable uh, to uh, that kind of idea. <laughs> uh, so, as far as the pilot, the pilot crisis uh, peer uh, respite center, uh, wonderful idea. And here's my thinking on this. I don't know if some of you know that I'm a libertarian. So I'm different from some of these uh, other candidates up here. You know, I don't want to get into a knockdown drag out here with other political parties. But uh, as a libertarian, we kind of think outside the box. So here's a suggestion. Why don't we start a petition right now? I know it's a little bit late to get it on the, uh, the uh, ballot uh, this time uh, for the city charter because that's an excellent way to do things. And then once you get that petition up and they have to consider it on the next uh, uh, city charter whenever they can. Unfortunately, we can only do that every two years and they've kind of loaded up the, this and, and we've missed a deadline on getting, uh, you know, something, a petition on the city charter this time. But let's start right now. Everybody in this room, I do a lot of block walking. I promise you I'll collect more signatures on that petition then all the other candidates up here will just take a challenge and it'll be on the next uh, time and you know and whether or not we succeed in getting it on as a city charter or not we can at least uh, bring more public awareness to what we want to do thank you thank you i'd like to ask the audience how many of you are familiar with the texas jc's ever heard of them okay I'm a former Texas JC, and one of their lines in their creeds is, service to humanity is the best work of life. If that exemplifies me, it does, 100%. It exemplifies who I am as a person. And that's how I've led my life, is being of service. And I can tell by looking at each one of you, you love people too, otherwise you wouldn't be in the field that you're in. And I would support having, uh, what was the term that you used? The a respite. Crisis peer respite. Crisis, okay. crisis peer respite. Crisis. Cry, yes, I would support that, and I think that's a great idea. We all live in this community. We all have to work together. We all have to take care of each other. And I think us getting together and forming something that would be of service to those in need, I think that's important. We need to address those issues. And I believe that um, we could start... You know, I saw you clap earlier with Cheryl Scully. I, I think we could cut her salary in half or, and find somebody else and take those funds and use it towards putting it towards this facility. And, uh, and if, if she's not satisfied with that, get someone else. So anyway, uh, closing statement, I'll wait for that till later. Thank you. I agree with Cynthia. We could take half of Cheryl Scully's salary and start that crisis center um, <laughs> and that would work um can i ask y'all also something are y'all familiar with the crit has anybody heard of the crit see i don't know i know the that's the acronym but i always forget what it stands for but san antonio across from morgan's wonderland has what's been, been built is the crit and that organization is for children with special needs I believe that San Antonio should become, because of those two organizations being across from each other, they are not funded by city or state. I believe that because of those two organizations here, Morgan's Wonderland and the CRIT, 
that San Antonio should be like a national center for persons with special needs and awareness. I believe that as the city grows, we need to grow our medical arena to help with jobs. And the main part of that would be for jobs for persons with special needs, psychologists, doctors in that area. People are moving to San Antonio because of those two uh, organizations being here. There's 20 other crits built throughout the Latin American countries. This is the first one that's been built in the United States, and I guess it was purposely, purposely built across from Morgan's Wonderland. But in the Latin American countries, they do a fundraiser for this crit, and they raise $15 million a year by phone and by having um, Spanish actors asking for money. And um, so this last year in December, and this is the second year they do it, They've raised this year $15 million to help support that organization, and I think that we should help support it. But of course, we need to go ahead and fund a crisis center, but it shouldn't be with city monies alone. I think we should look for donations from through big businesses to help support that. Thank you. We know that the data shows us that peer-to-peer -peer involvement and networks work. It works when you're a wounded warrior. It works when you've lost a child uh, to a disease. It works in all areas of health and in crisis because families will talk to families, prosumers to prosumers. But also, the community needs to engage in this discussion. Before we really commit to a peer-to-peer -peer network and crisis center, I know that it would be important, but what I don't want us to see, and what happens many times, is that you get a champion, and it becomes very, very important, and it gets funded one cycle of the council. People get excited, they get trained, and then there's no sustainability plan. And what happens is the families and the people who are in this peer-to-peer -peer network end up depending and getting that, and then the funding dries up. So in that discussion, it, I would have to be certain, because I don't want to set our families up yet for another fall, that, that we have something that would be sustainable. But I know what can be sustainable. I am a real believer in first aid. Maybe it's because I'm a pharmacist and I've worked in an emergency room on the Code Blue team. And I know how important it is for the general population to understand things like first aid and CPR. No mention has been made, and I would really like to see the discussion on mental health first aid, a community program that is dedicated to informing and training the general population about how to recognize the signs, the symptoms of those with mental illness. It's been very effective in other counties. It's been shown to really increase that. Just think about how many people have saved lives because they know CPR. I would be really very excited if through prosumers and through us that we look at establishing San Antonio as one of the premier cities in mental health first aid. Thank you very much. Um, a new um, institution uh, to pay dollars to by the city, I would not do that. Uh, what I would do, though, is I, was, I would contribute dollars to the organization. Um, it's only because I, have a, I would have, or the next mayor would have, other things that they would have to do. And by giving a contribution and stopping all new accounts from coming in, it would bring a lot more money, and we would be able to do more things for the, our city of San Antonio. Um, to be able to raise money for a certain um, establishment or an establishment that y'all have, um, I don't know what type of permits y'all have, but they have different type of permits that y'all can utilize. Um, there's a certificate that they give you. It's, it's the permit um, that allows you to go out and um, obtain contributions from the city. That, um, yeah. Uh, and that's really not expensive. Um, I think it's a... Uh, um, I forgot what, it was, what it's called. But they do have certificates that y'all can obtain to start going out into the public and receiving dollars for that institution. Okay. 
My, my apologies. I'm going to have to leave and I'll forego my statement. Just thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. It's good to see you all. Thank you. I would definitely fund the program. But I'd go two steps further. Rather than have one centralized building, there's a lot of empty buildings out here in the city of San Antonio. I would locate one in every sector of the city so that those people who need the help can get there. Whether you be, the problem is transportation. If you locate it in one central location, people are going to have trouble getting to it. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in, in having a centralized location. We need to spread the, the workforce and the help throughout the city. As far as uh, funding it, you heard me say it before, accountability. And eliminate city council wealth, uh, corporate welfare. Same people, same groups are always getting the money. Let's cut them off, become self-sufficient. My wife runs that budget at my house, and I can tell you this. Is it a want or is it a need? If it's a want, I'm not getting it. Okay? But if it's a need, I'll get it. So why can't the city council operate under that rule? And sooner or later, all those up there are going to become senior citizens. And yes, I too will someday have a mental issue. And I'm going to need the help. And I hope that it's there for me as I am for it now. And all I ask is this. With me, you get the truth. You will not get any rhetoric. I don't like rhetoric. Rhetoric uh, tends to uh, become complacent with people. I don't want to be mayor. I mean, I don't want to be governor. And I don't want to be vice president. I want to be your mayor, a stay-at-home mayor, and do what's right for the people. Do it for me, because I'd do it for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, if each of you would like, we can have, we're going to, now each of you have two minutes to wrap up. Either you can share about more mental health issues, or if you would like to just share what your platform in general is, you're welcome to do that as well. So, two minutes, please, and then we'll just go. Two minutes. My name is Pogo Marcello Allen Reese again. I was born in Monroe, Louisiana. I used to be a substitute teacher in Arlington, Texas. And one thing I would do, I would have this little system where I wouldn't talk to the kids, and I would write on uh, the board. Number one, no talking. Number two, stay in your seats. Number three, keep working, start working. And I would have a clipboard to go around the classroom. And one of these little girls wrote on the clipboard that day, I feel like killing myself. And I say, whoa, hold up. It's time to just, you know, rewind. I can't do nothing else right here. I had to sit down on it. And then as I'm walking around, I look at her arm lolly slash marks on her arm. As a substance teacher, don't you think a principal should tell you, well, she's trying to kill herself like three times? Because as a substitute teacher, I'm trying to get math inside of your head and not deal with suicidal tendencies. So when you have teachers that are dealing with issues like that, and you have the police dealing with issues like that, and the issue that I was dealing with on the bus about the woman walking around trying to get run over, that's a whole lot of issues going on in our country. And as you said before, the money is getting short for everything. You can't keep on saying, I'm going to move this money over here, move this money over here. you got to grow the pot to have money to do anything. Okay, uh, one minute, what was it? two minutes. Uh, I am, am trying to uh, convey to you my strong feelings about violence and, and dealing with violence uh, throughout our community. Uh, and I mentioned the fact that I am a libertarian. So what does that mean to you? What does that mean for our local politics? And what does that mean globally? Because uh, as you know, uh, some of you know that it's very difficult for third parties, like Libertarian Party, Green Party. In other words, we have a two-party system in the United States, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Some would say here in San Antonio we only have a one-party system that oftentimes uh, uh, 
like a candidate like Nelson Wolf, for instance, who I just finished a campaign against uh, this past November running for county judge, that he was able to get significant Republican votes to hold on to his seat uh, for Bear County judge. So the point is uh, that if we want to do something different, if we want to change the world, if we want to reach out there, I, w I would like to do that. So I would, like, I would like to sign up for what you are doing. And I would like to really try to do something. You know, uh, a famous uh, anthropologist once said, Margaret Mead, you know, who, what does it take to change the world or only a few in the, you know, if you get together a few people to change the world, and indeed, really, that's the only world, way the world has ever changed. In other words, it starts with a little idea, a few people get together, and uh, then it builds and builds and builds. So because San Antonio is so crucial to Texas, really, and to the United States history, I think you all have to be aware of the unique role that San Antonio plays. San Antonio was here before there was a Texas, before there was a United States of America. So we have a unique place to play in world history in reaching out and building that global network of nonviolence and, you know, sound health of the mind. Thank you. Just like Abraham Lincoln said, government should be of the people, by the people, and for the people. And I firmly believe that, and I stand on that. If you want a fair and equitable voice that's going to echo what you want and how you want to be governed, I am that person. I am a fair person. I am an honest person. I am a God-fearing woman, and I am a woman of my word. I believe so confidently and so strongly in my abilities to represent you that I stand before you today and tell you that if you decide to elect me as your next mayor and I do not have things going the way you want it to go in the direction that you said you wanted to go, I want you to fire me. That is what I believe and I believe anyone that goes into politics should have the courage of their convictions to stand here before you today and tell you that. I have that conviction. I ask for your support. I ask for your vote. And I ask that you seriously consider me as your next mayor. Please go to my website and see what my ideas are straight across the board. CynthiaBrimForMayor.com. Thank you. You know, my heart is in this community. Like I mentioned earlier that I've been doing over like 40 years of community service, and it all started back in California as a child when I, my dad, I'm actually a product of my parents, my dad would take me to the fields with Cesar Chavez to help um, support the women that were being, they were working in the fields, and they were being sprayed on by planes that would, with pesticides, and they were being told that it was water to cool them down. Well, those poor people didn't know any better. And one of my classmates was a young man. I'm not sure how old I was, but about nine. He had no arms. But he was the best swimmer in the school. He would always win the competitions. And I never understood how he could meet those challenges. Well, people with special needs can meet challenges if we help them. And I believe that here in this city, like I said, we should become a national center for persons with special needs to give an awareness throughout the country. It doesn't just have to be here in San Antonio. And me, with my experiences, me, she told me one, 30 seconds only. <laughs> <the wrong> one. <laughs> me, with my experiences as a court administrator putting together the juvenile justice courts, the, the domestic violence courts, working in the county, learning about municipal government, we can actually start all of those things now without funding and look for funding, whether it's through the private sector or in the community, we can, and I would welcome, um, if I'm mayor, that y'all are right there with me helping to put together um, situations or because I tell my friend Debbie that's here with me today that I want to put together commissions throughout the city 
so that the voters can help decide. Not for me to get up there and be the mayor. I want to be the person that's helping y'all make decisions. I don't want to be there to make the decision. I don't think that's right. We don't need a mayor. We already have Scully. She does that. You know, we need a mayor that's going to work with the people, with the voter, not just with people with money. So together, I would like to build this city into a national awareness center for persons with special needs. Thank you so much. My name is Gerard Ponce. Hi, um, my name is Cynthia Cavazos and I'm a candidate for uh, mayor. Um, there's a lot of different things that our city is going to need and I know that mental health is an, uh, is an, an important, important <coughs> issue only because it deals with crime and to, br to be able to bring our city's crime to a minimum we have to make sure that the people in our city of San Antonio are taken care of mentally, physically and physically I mean everybody has to have a home. Um, the budget, uh, again, I'm going to go ahead and stress that $1 billion is what we have available in the budget to work with. Uh, we've already paid um, the, well, the police officers and the firemen will have already gotten their money for the year or however they do that. I really don't know how they, they appropriate their dollars or when they receive them. Um, but all that other money, it's for the city. So if you are going to have some type of cause and bring it, whether I'm the mayor or somebody else is the mayor, they will review it and they will take a look and decide whether if it's a good, decide whether it's good or not. My name is Cynthia Cavazos. Thank you. Well, as you all know, I'm Raymond Zavala, and I've been an advocate for the seniors, for the youth, the uh, disabled, and the veterans. I can guarantee you right now that no one, remember I said I don't make promises, I can guarantee you this, that no one on the city council has read the entire budget for this year. If you believe that they did, ask them if, if they're speed uh, readers or technical writers. Because I guarantee you, they'll say, oh, I read it. And you ask them a, a question about the budget, and they will, well, let me get back with you. I uh, don't remember that one. Okay? For me, they should, it should be mandatory that you read that budget, and then you sign off on it, acknowledging that you did read it, and you did understand it, and not just pencil whip it. I, for one, believe in this. We have a very weak city council. I'm not the Pied Piper. I will never be the Pied Piper for you. I will be a leader, but I want those that are with me to wholeheartedly agree that it's a good uh, ordinance, one that will uh, be uh, acceptable to the citizens of San Antonio, that everything we do is not about the business community. It's about the people. One candidate up here was endorsed back in June by the commit by the uh, business community. Really? Didn't even give us a chance. Why? I am not a sellout. So I say again, I am not a sellout. No one, there's four things that are not for sale in my life. The love of God, the love of my wife, my family, my, my honor, and my vote. I am not for sale, ladies and gentlemen. I stand tall, and even though I may be 63 years old. I've had a lot of experience and I have common sense. And more than that, I'm willing to work for you because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your time, your willingness to serve. Um, I know that there has to be some level of passion for you to put yourselves through what it takes to run for office. So, um, on behalf of the prosumers, thank you, each of you, for willing, for being willing. Um, it's been an honor to have you with us, and um, we, uh, we, 
I'm just so bold as to say, in your future endeavors, whenever you look at what are the issues of mental health in San Antonio, remember the prisoners. We have a unique point of view in that we work, we are the ones receiving all of the services that look really good on paper, but don't always translate into what we expected them to do. So thank you so much for being here. And for all of you, thank you. Uh, yes, so just to remind you, we, we didn't put this together by ourselves. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank all of our volunteers. Woo! Uh, yes. I especially want to thank Cindy Trevino. Cindy did the lion's share of the work. And uh, Cindy, really, thank you. This is this is your win and your victory. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Cindy, thank you. You've done an amazing job.